God. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you. Thank you for loving us. Today we... Thank you. Thank you for our mothers and the women who are like mothers to us. There's a lot we don't know right now and a lot to keep track of. Thank you for people like our moms who love us and keep us safe. Help us all to be loving and caring like them. Amen. Hi, I'm Gwen Delapel, and I am Director of De Development for Cornerstone Family Programs and Morristown Neighborhood House. Thank you so much for inviting me into your home today. We, I'm going to show you a very short video uh, about two of our bigger programs, and I really want to thank the First Presbyterian Church of New Vernon for your support over the years and volunteering and monetary support for all of our programs. We are truly, truly grateful. Uh, the beginning of the video is about our adult day center. We have two right now. We just opened a second one recently and it will show you our uh, family members of our clients there and how much we are helping them to continue with their lives and working um, and making sure that their family member is um, cared for and fed from early in the morning and through dinner. The second part of the video is about our uh, Morristown neighborhood house, which we affectionately call the NABE. And you will see that video is done by our NABE kids. They filmed it themselves, so please enjoy it. And I just can't thank you enough again for uh, letting us show you what we're doing. And in this pandemic, uh, we're all suffering and especially our families. And we're just trying to feed them and hopefully keep our programs going in the future. And can't thank you enough for all you do. Have a great day. I was at the end of my ropes. I didn't know where I, what I was going to do. My husband, Warren, comes to Cornerstone Daycare. It was a lifeline for not only for myself, but for Warren, because it gets him social with people. He loves it. The people here, they're patient, kind, understanding. It makes him feel worthwhile. He's busy, he can walk around and feel comfortable. It's given me peace of mind. I, I can't imagine my life without them, I, I can't. It's been a weight lifted off my shoulders. They have such good activities here. He has plants that come home. He comes home with all of his, his crafts. And we have a table set aside just for his crafts. And the fact that I can bring him here in the morning have the total confidence that he's in great hands and that they're caring for him with this loving staff. I bring him here at 8.30 in the morning, I pick him up at 5.30 in the afternoon, and he has nothing but positive things to say. Cornerstone has been a huge, has helped take a huge burden off my shoulders. And I'm very grateful and thankful that you guys were able to take him and just for the everyday loving care that you guys give him. She's able to come in with no fuss, no no resistance, walk right into the facility, and every morning, different uh, caregiver would be at the door greeting with a broad smile. Cornerstone has uh, given my mom a place and a purpose to go to every morning. She's dressed up, ready to go to a place that there now has now become her community.
This week's scripture, John 14, 1 through 14. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. After I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Then I will take you to be with me so you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how do we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, and I am the truth and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. If you really knew me, then you would know my Father too. But now you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. That is all we need. Jesus answered, I have been with you a long time now. Do you still not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So why do you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you don't come from me. The Father lives in me and he is doing his own work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or believe me because of the miracles I have done. I tell you the truth. He who believes in me will do the same things that I do. He will do even greater things than, than these because I am going to the Father. And if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it for you. Then the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. I am the way the Savior said, and I would follow on. Content to know that after night shall break a glorious dawn. I am the truth, the truth shall be a beacon light to Father 
In my Father's house are many rooms, and I am going ahead to prepare a place for you. These words come from the 14th chapter of John, which we'll be hearing from both this week and next week. This is Jesus' farewell speech to the disciples. He's giving them a bit of a pep talk before he leaves them behind to continue the work that, up to this point, they'd been doing together. I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you, Jesus says, and I will come back and bring you to myself. You know the way to where I'm going. We hear these words at funerals all the time. I actually use them at services I conducted both this week and last week. And we use these words because they're comforting to us. For the disciples, Jesus was reminding them that they would not be alone as they continued his ministry. And for us, there's the promise of an eternal home made ready especially for us. God's great big mansion within an unimaginable number of rooms each one different, each one somehow right and perfect as a dwelling place. This is a beautiful image of heaven. But Jesus' farewell speech doesn't end there. It quickly becomes complicated when Thomas, the disciple, comes back to keep things real. He voices a question that's probably on everyone's mind. He says, Jesus, we actually don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus replies, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And here the text seems to take a turn. All of a sudden, this warm, inviting text about the expansiveness of God's love and how big God's house is seems to narrow. Sam Lloyd, preaching at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., points out that all three of the Abrahamic faiths have a strain of exclusivity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first of the Ten Commandments in the faith of Israel. The faith of Islam asserts that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Now these assertions are powerful claims when they are used to challenge the idolatries that people fall into. But when they're turned into weapons, denying or denouncing other communities of faith, they become a bit more problematic. Put another way, we can hear in these words a danger of worshiping at the altar of materialism, of owning more, of controlling more, of making growth and profit our guiding virtues. These things, Jesus reminds us, are not the way to eternal life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And that's a powerful message, and it's one that feels especially relevant right now. But over the centuries, some have read this passage and heard in it a call to exclusivity. Sometimes this passage is used to reinforce a belief that we, and only we, have rooms prepared for us in that great mansion in the sky. And Christian history has been marked with a lot of disagreements stemming from this. Disagreements over everything from the correct date of celebrating Easter, to the substance and meaning of the Lord's Supper, to who can and cannot serve as a minister. And sadly, schism after schism and split after split have turned that once great mansion into the sky, into something more like a city of individual silos each one walled off from the next. And as everyone tries to figure out what Jesus meant and where he was actually going, Thomas comes back in to remind us that as much as we might not like to admit it, there is really a lot that we don't know. I recently started reading a book with a group of pastors here in Newton Presbytery called How to Lead when you don't know where you're going. It was written by Susan Beaumont, who is a church consultant and a professor at Wesley Seminary. And the premise of the book is to help people think about leadership in uncertain times. Beaumont calls these liminal seasons. And a liminal season is a time when one thing has come to an end 
and a new thing is not yet ready to begin. Now, the church as an institution has been living in a liminal season for almost a decade now. We hear again and again that the traditional model of church is not connecting with people or as effective as it used to be. We read in surveys and census data that more and more people are identifying as non-religious. Among millennials like me, they call it the rise of the nuns. Now, all of that was already at play for churches around the country. And if you didn't know where you were going already, this pandemic and the crisis that it has brought about might feel like it's just enough to do you in. And plenty of people are feeling this right now. Liminal seasons are, by definition, uncertain. They're filled with extreme disorientation, and that makes people anxious. Beaumont points out that in liminal seasons, people feel a really deep longing to do one of two things. Some people want to return to the way things used to be, to something that was comfortable and familiar. And other people want to rush ahead to the new thing so that something feels resolved. And we can't go back to the way things were. That's very clear. And what will be is not yet possible yet. So we are stuck in the middle. We are stuck in between what was and what will be. And the best advice that I've been given is to get used to it. We can't be certain about where we're going. We may hope for certainty. We may try to create it. But page after page of what I've read makes it clear that a lot of that work is spinning your wheels. Because until you know the destination that you're heading towards, there's no effective way of creating a roadmap to get there. If Thomas, the disciple, was listening at this point, he'd probably say something like, well, that sounds interesting, and it seems to make sense, but it's also really depressing. If we can't go back to the way things were, and there's no way to know where we're going or when we'll get there, what should we be doing with our time right now? And the answer that the early church found, and the answer that Beaumont's book points to, is community a new kind of community. She calls it communitas. Seasons like the one we're in right now are full of disorientation, disruption, and danger. But they're also full of some really unique opportunities. People are relating to each other in new ways right now. People are taking time to speak with others in different ways. And a lot of the old social structures and hierarchies are fading into the background. This means people have a chance to dream, to problem solve, and to collaborate in new ways. And we've seen that happening all around us, even here locally. I'm thinking of the Help for Harding program that has become a strong network to support the elderly and vulnerable members of our community. We've seen multiple campaigns by our Mission and Outreach Committee provide financial support, much needed supplies, and food to our nonprofit partners. Around the world, we're seeing new collaboration in the medical field, online choral performances, virtual counseling session, and even big corporations rethinking the products they offer and how they relate to both their employees and their customers. The things that we do in this season will not be as fine-tuned or polished as they were in the season before. And if you've been on one of our Zoom calls, you probably already know that. Despite the occasional mess or confusion, the things that we are doing right now are really profound. They're giving us great insight into new things that we can do together into new ways that we can serve our community and relate to each other. They're also giving people a chance to discover skills and abilities that they might not have fully appreciated before. They're giving organizations a chance to notice new leaders stepping up and stretching their legs. As we journey into this liminal season together, we join a whole company of saints who have gone before us. 
We join Abraham and Sarah who left their home to start a new life in the promised land. We join Moses who led the Israelites through the desert for 40 years. Job who sat in the ashes of his ruined life as his friends came and went. All of them lived in a liminal season where everything had changed and the future was uncertain. All of them had doubts, questions, and anxiety. But all of them also encountered God in the midst of the unknown and emerged on the other side as changed people. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? May we all have the patience to be all right with that for a while. May we all have the faith to know that God is with us nonetheless. And may we have the courage to live into this season, that we might emerge on the other side as changed people, as the people that God has created us to be. Amen. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all well and staying healthy. I, for one, have been enjoying Bill's sermons online, but I am looking forward to getting dressed for church again, and I can't wait to see you all again soon. I wanted to give you all a quick update from the Finance Committee. To be sure, this is a challenging time for us all. Over the past few years, we've made great progress towards a balanced budget, but not without unforeseen challenges. And now with this new way of attending service, we face a new challenge. I believe that once again, as a church, we will rise to this challenge. Bill has taken on many new duties as our church staff has been furloughed for their safety and as mandated by the governor. Besides helping us all stay connected and keeping God's message alive, he has also been working with success to secure funds from the government stimulus package known as the PPP. This will offer some temporary relief and of a possible cash crunch. I'd like to thank those of you who have accelerated your pledge commitments, but one part of our budget that has suffered during this separation is plate offerings, and without them, we will surely have a shortfall in our budget. So if this has been your method of support to the church in the past, I ask that you consider sending in an offering. Now, as we worship virtually, I am now passing you the virtual offering plate. You can do this by sending in your offering to P.O. Box 218 to the New Vernon Post Office, or you can take advantage of our new online giving tab on the church's webpage. Bill has added a tab in the lower right banner of the home page. It's very easy and will make all the difference in getting through this crisis together. Many thanks and God bless. Will you please join me in praying for our mothers and for the people who are like mothers to us? Holy God, on this day we pray for the women in our church and in our lives, and the women we know <clears throat> Holy God, on this day we pray for the women in our church, women in our lives, and women around the world. We pray for those who gave birth this year in celebration with them. We pray for those who have lost a child this year, and for those who experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoption, or running away. We mourn alongside them. We pray for those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment. We pray in solidarity with them. We pray for those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms. We pray for those who have a warm and close relationship with their children and feel deeply for those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with their children. 
We grieve with those who lost their mothers this year. We pray for those who have experienced abuse at the hands of their mothers, acknowledging that this is a painful reality in our world today. We give thanks for those who have lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood. We are better for having mothers like you in our midst. We mourn for those for whom life has not turned out the way they longed for it to be. And we pray for the many, many other amazing, rewarding, complex, and challenging paths parenting can take. For those who are step parents, those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year. For those who place children up for adoption, and those who are pregnant with new life. On this Mother's Day, we remember that mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we give thanks to God for the strength, guidance, and resilience of our mothers and those who are like mothers to us every single day. Amen. your thumb You showed me how to walk and talk I showed you how patient you become And all those things you thought I didn't hear Those old cliches of parenthood You warned me to hold dear You learned to roll your eyes from your wife Crazy ants tell you all the secrets of life You learn to belch and cuss from your daddy and your brother You learn to love from your mother And somewhere along the line My hand outgrew yours Sorry I kept growing up I bet you wish my sense of humor would mature thousand things I saw you say and do A broken heart stood no chance against you You learned to roll your eyes from your wife Crazy ants tell you all the secrets of life You learned to belch and cuss from your daddy and your brother You learned to love from your mother to learn to love from your mother. 